Well, good evening, everybody. It's 530 and we are ready to get started with our Medical Entrepreneur Speaker Series. Uh, the theme of the 2021 Medical Entrepreneur Speaker Series is both sides of the fence. Each speaker that we feature during this series is an entrepreneur at the WMED Innovation Center and also a WMED faculty member. And the purpose of this series is to help doctors, students, researchers, and entrepreneurs more deeply understand the multifaceted nature of innovation and commercialization. Our speaker today who is joining us is Dr. Robert Kennedy. Uh, Dr. Kennedy is a WMED Research Assistant Professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences, and he is also Chief Scientific Officer of Vestron Corporation. He has over 25 years of research management experience, and he leads Vestron's molecular biology and chemistry development teams. So before we turn this over to uh, Bob and get started, I'd like to just take care of a little bit of housekeeping. If you all could please remember to have yourselves on mute that would be terrific. And if you would like to ask any questions, we will have question and answer towards the end. Um, if for some reason you would like to put it in the chat and have me ask the question or have Bob read the question, that is perfectly acceptable as well. Um, your controls are at the top in the black bar across the top. You can mute your microphone as well as mute your camera if you please. And um, the conversation, show conversation is the chat tool. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Bob, and you may introduce yourselves and tell me all about the wonderful things happening at Vesteron. Sure. Well, let me tell you about today. Um, in fact, an hour ago, a press release went out that we have closed on our series B1. Um, may maybe for the second time, I don't know. <laughs> so. Um, uh, uh, can you see my slides? Not yet. No, not yet. Not yet. Where's your shared window? Oh. Uh, what is going on here? We did just check this and we confirmed that it was working. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Hey, Sandra, while he's doing that, I can't get my bar to move. It's kind of right in the middle of the screen. How do you, is there a way of doing that? Which bar? What do you mean? Uh, the one you were talking about where you can hit mute or turn your camera on and off and stuff. Oh, it's in the middle of your screen? It should yeah. be at the top. I am not sure how you would move that. Yeah, I've tried. I can't find any place in there to grab it, to drag it. Uh, I'm not, That's, I don't yeah. use Teams very often. Wrong screen, Bob. We're seeing we're yeah. seeing all of us. There we go. We're seeing my desktop. Yeah. I thought. Sorry, it's taking a bit to go here. Um, I should share my desktop. I believe is best. But why don't I just share? Hey, Bob. Uh, did that? Are you now seeing? Yes. It? Now we see it. Yes. Great. And then I'll get to this presentation mode, hopefully. And hopefully you now have a full page of screen. Yes. OK. So uh, yeah, so uh, today at 4 p.m. they released a press release that um, Vestron is closed on a Series B1. Um, always, always good for the uh, 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 Innovation Center when companies are in money. Um, and it turns out to be 18 when we were looking for 10 million. Um, so uh, very exciting to have uh, what ended up being an oversubscribed round. Um, uh, I, I did not start out life as a as a as Sandra puts it, an entrepreneur. Um, I uh, started out as a synthetic organic chemist, uh, angling towards academia, ending up ultimately on the faculty at Columbia. Um, uh, and, and then uh, failing that, um, I uh, uh, went into the pharmaceutical industry and was involved in a number of uh, um, oh, uh, disciplines, uh, 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 radio uh, uh, positron emission tomography, radio ligand synthesis, combinatorial chemistry, and then finally uh, cardiovascular drug discovery. Um, and then 
um, uh, uh, Pfizer ran into, I guess, the patent cliff um, that um, many of you would know of or have heard of. And rather than uh, deal with that uh, 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 difficult period uh, in pharma, I, I looked around for other things to um, um, get involved in. And I uh, found this company. I, I didn't uh, originate the company. I, I, I uh, started as a consultant, then eventually brought on uh, about 10 years ago. And this is a company that is working with an interesting class of molecules that has had some application in pharma, uh, particularly a refractory treatment of pain by a conotoxin. And this, these are peptides, but nobody had ever actually applied these to agriculture. And that seemed to me to be an interesting thing to do. Um, chemists seem to have gained mastery of larger and mo larger molecules over time. These molecules are approximately halfway between a true protein and um, a, uh, a small molecule, about 30 times larger and 30 times smaller uh, 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 between the two. So. Um, it seemed like an interesting thing to get involved in. And uh, and I, I will tell you that I see this company through the eyes of a medicinal chemist. And if you will bear that in mind, then perhaps um, uh, uh, this medical entrepreneur label for this uh, series of talks will uh, better apply to, to what we're doing. Um, problems. My slide is not changing. Oh, there. There, okay. So um, what we're involved in in agriculture is crop protection. And we believe that um, this industry is where pharma was some time ago. Um, it's dominated by a small number of large companies, probably only three or four at this point. When I uh, began with Vestron, it had around um, uh, six large companies. They have since gone through uh, a number of mergers which is you know, sort of symptomatic of an industry that has a failing business model. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of the uh, research was done in-house at the large companies and predominantly focused on small molecule synthetics. And so they have increasing regulatory costs, um, exploding through the roof, longer development timelines, more late stage product failures, um, uh, in fact, the last two large commercial launches, both were pulled post product launch. And um, you would understand that to be uh, just fatal to an industry, if not companies uh, particularly. Um, and, and there have been just a declining pace of um, uh, 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 product introductions. And so how did the industry adapt? Well, they moved from small molecule synthetics to biologics. Uh, a lot of this has to do with the improved tox profile of proteins. Uh, they're, they're, they can be more specific, um, and so you don't have off-target effects. As well, proteins um, do not have reactive metabolites uh, upon uh, metabolism, which then can create idiopathic tox that only surfaces in late-stage trials. Uh, furthermore, um, they shifted from small company uh, uh, from small companies being you know, supplying research uh, to actually uh, uh, molecules uh, on the market. Um, and uh, as a result of this, uh, IPO and M&A transactions uh, greatly increased over the past uh, uh, couple decades. Um, what, what was interesting in some of our scholarship around this was that the early, uh, we began Vestron thinking that we would exit as a technology platform. Um, but unfortunately, those who, who would acquire us, uh, they were all involved in mega merger uh, to deal with the um, uh, uh, ailing business model in, uh, in AgChem. And um, uh, what happened in pharma uh, was that uh, a lot of the companies IPO'd because they were not sufficiently valued by the potential acquirers. And so eventually the uh, established players began to understand that and began their um, uh, more appropriately valued M&A activity. And you see this here in this slide where initially everybody had to IPO in order to establish liquidity um, uh, and have that wonderful event where everybody um, 
uh, uh, makes money. Uh, but only uh, after uh, the value was established in the public markets did you see the rapid increase in M&A activity uh, by the uh, established players. Um, this was a surprising uh, fact uh, uh, to me. So crop protection, uh, we expect the same to play out. Um, and, and crop protection is uh, absolutely essential to agricultural productivity. Um, and um, if you look at what we would lose uh, uh, without uh, insecticides, fungicides, and bactericides in uh, agriculture today, uh, 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 we would lose that orange bar um, uh, 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 in terms of the total supply of, of products and be left only with the red bar um, uh, uh, absent all these chemicals um, that we're using to protect our food. Um, and, and if you want an interesting uh, fact, uh, people like to talk about the global population at all. I'm, I'm a little more uh, uh, parochial, I suppose. Um, if you were to ask the question, how many acres are of, of arable land are there in the United States under cultivation? It's about 330 million. And how many people are there in the United States? Oh, about 330 million. Uh, and so we grow all our food uh, with uh, access to export um, and to feed uh, animals on that one acre per person. And not having a green thumb, that motivates me uh, considerably um, and, and, and personalizes uh, just how important it is to maximize the yield of, of the land that we have that is not uh, uh, available, uh, that, that, of which there is no more available. So um, we believe crop protection uh, requires uh, increased innovation. Um, it's uh, uh, it, uh, crop protection provides um, up to 50% of our total yield of, of um, food. Um, and, you know, insects are, can be thought of as similar to um, uh, microbes. They do evolve resistance like uh, antibiotics. And, um, and so we need a constant stream of new molecules because these uh, insects develop resistance. And um, uh, the small number of truly uh, effective pesticides, um, uh, the fewer you have, the fewer tools you have, the less you can rotate amongst them, and as a consequence, you generate resistance much more quickly. Resistance is an inevitability. One's only hope is to slow this uh, relative to our innovation. Um, and, and, and that's what modern growers do. Uh, they rotate through uh, uh, the best products that they can use, um, as many as five uh, insecticides for a given crop that they're growing. And so one of the things that was a part of education of uh, VCs in this area is that you didn't have to be the single far and away best product on the market. You merely had to make the batting order, right? Um, you had to be amongst the top ro uh, rotating uh, chemicals that they would use or products that they would use on the market. Um, and uh, there are resistant uh, insects to every chemical insecticide we do, uh, use today, and we are simply fighting that with these rotation strategies. Um, here you see two uh, plots that roughly um, uh, uh, um, uh, summarize what uh, I've, I've told you in an earlier slide, that the number of novel um, uh, active ingredients uh, that are being brought to the market is declining over time, and the costs of developing these active molecules is, de is uh, increasing, and we're seeing increased attrition in late stage development, all of which um, is a disturbing pattern, but consistent pattern uh, in this industry and correlates to what happened in pharma uh, over a decade ago. Uh, furthermore, in the EU, uh, they are outlawing and deregistering insecticides hand over fist. I've been told by one ag, a major ag chem um, uh, player uh, that they expect Europe will probably only have one synthetic chemical on the market for controlling insects in another decade. Um, uh, certainly, they've um, uh, taken off the market 300 um, uh, 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 since 1991, uh, and there are fewer and fewer um, uh, products making it to the market, um, uh, and even new ones uh, being removed from the market. This decreases the number of tools in the grower's uh, uh, war chest, if you will, uh, and increases the rate of re emergence of resistance. All of this is a, a bad fact pattern um, and something that I think that we can do uh, something about. 
Um, and, and, and that is that we, I think in, in this time, we need to make a shift in crop protection. You know, chemical and in, uh, insecticides provide great efficacy, but um, there is off-target activity against beneficial insects. There's environmental damage, contamination of uh, aquifers, etc. cetera. Um, and there is an increased sensitivity as well as actual uh, risk uh, to consumers and field labor. Um, so uh, they certainly have their place, um, but there are some uh, problems with them. Um, and it's uh, difficult to commercialize these and they're facing resistance challenges. Uh, our, our goal is to um, lead a peptide based revolution in crop protection. Uh, we're going to provide growers with new chemistries and by chemistries, I mean molecules that act by a new mode of action uh, that address proven targets. So uh, we plan to re-drug the existing commercially um, uh, drugged targets in crop protection uh, with new molecules and that these peptides will overcome existing resistance uh, and provide a, a much more desirable uh, safety profile for workers, um, uh, beneficial insects uh, in the environment. Uh, we've uh, 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 our first product, which I'll tell you about, uh, was recognized uh, uh, some time ago, uh, six years ago, uh, in Switzerland uh, with the Bernard Bloom Award uh, by uh, an international biocontrol manufacturers association, uh, and then here recently in the last year by the EPA Green Chemistry Award. Uh, this name, the name for this award, was changed from the Presidential Green Chemistry Award, which. I, I, I preferred over this one, but uh, uh, that, that is what it is. Um, so uh, we're actually the first company in ag uh, to bring a portfolio of peptides um, um, based biological products to crop protection. And we've got one on the market, which I'll tell you about today. Um, as you might imagine, uh, Seth, uh, uh, there are some pretty clear reasons why peptides uh, are desirable. Um, uh, uh, they are uh, effectively without toxicity to humans, mammals, fish, birds, uh, and beneficial insects. Um, I'm not able to say that they are absolutely safe. Uh, the EPA doesn't like that, uh, but they are um, uh, practically uh, non-toxic. Um, and, uh, uh, and what this means is that we can spray a crop and then harvest it without a pre-harvest interval. So we don't have to wait 20 days after spraying a crop. Um, uh, these peptides are, um, uh, are exempt from a tolerance, which is to say the residue is not regulated. Um, they're sustainable. We produce our peptides um, by fermentation uh, and heterologously uh, expressed uh, in yeast. Um, these peptides actually have known targets, and so they, are, uh, uh, they can be as effective as small molecules. Um, and uh, we believe, it's a theory we hope to prove, uh, but we postulate that it will be more difficult for peptides, uh, for resistance to develop to peptides. Um, a, a more flexible and broader footprint may yield that binding interaction to be less uh, vulnerable to uh, point mutations uh, at that surface. So we have had biologics uh, in crop protection for 30 years, but they're often live microbes, uh, no known mode of action, no specific mode of action. Uh, I believe I heard reduced fecundity at one point as the suggested mode of action of one uh, uh, um, product on the market. Uh, and, and they have less um, efficacy uh, relative to synthetics. Um, and uh, uh, it's more difficult to integrate this into these rotation strategies that are used in uh, crop protection. So the market sizes of those products tend to be much less um, and the average synthetic uh, is much greater, um, uh, averaging 7 uh, million, but leading and, um, molecules that are first in class uh, uh, can typically in some areas um, uh, be a billion dollar in sale uh, type of product at uh, maturity. Uh, so we have the opportunity then uh, to develop synthetic level of efficacy and, and, and therefore revenues um, uh, with the costs of a biologic to develop. Um, but the potential revenue stream uh, of a synthetic molecule. And that is, that is, uh, I think, um, at heart to uh, uh, our business case 
uh, if you will, development costs of biologics, market uh, realizable market potential of uh, chemicals. And so lining up synthetics versus uh, microbials, um, yes, uh, the costs to develop are low for microbials, uh, but the time, um, uh, however, uh, the amount of insect control you get is much less um, and uh, they don't last long, can have uh, difficulties in uh, the channel with respect to stability. Synthetics are the inverse of this, more difficult to develop, longer timelines, but some safety issues potentially, um, as well as, um, uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, they do have excellent efficacy and good COGS. We, we think uh, these peptides thread the needle in terms of cost to develop, uh, time to the market, um, a safety profile with the selectivity of these proteins, uh, and and yet, so we're able to realize the insect control uh, of a synthetic, but with the development costs of a microbial. So it, you would think then with that uh, profile that these molecules would have been developed before. However, um, nobody's been ever really to produce these at scale. Um, uh, uh, when I started with Vestron a decade ago, we were making 10 milligrams a liter, um, at hardly a, a commercial platform. Uh, there was no way to get these things into insects, so insects have to eat uh, contaminated leaves, for example, and this, these peptides have to get in uh, through the gut. And uh, I, I can tell you that it, it, it would be familiar to you, uh, I should say, that um, if someone were to develop a formulation to make insulin orally available, that would be a wealthy person indeed. This is the equivalent uh, challenge in, in insect control. And then finally, there was no regulatory path. No molecules um, had, had been proposed and no molecules had pioneered a regulatory path. With Vestron, what we've done is we've effectively addressed these three gating issues to commercialization of these types of peptides. We're now making 10 grams a liter uh, at uh, scale, and at scale I mean 100, uh, um, 100,000 liter uh, scale uh, is now being brought online uh, for our commercial product. Uh, we have found um, um, two mechanisms for generating bioavailability. Um, one is we have found a way to permeabilize the gut of insects, and then this lets the peptide through rather than a formal formulation that passively uh, 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 makes its way through the, uh, the gut. Uh, this is a strategy you might imagine that works for insects, but perhaps is not ph uh, pharmacologically relevant uh, in uh, uh, human health. Um, and then finally, we did pioneer a, a, um, a regulatory path uh, proceeding through uh, the microbial branch of the um, uh, uh, the microbial branch of the BPPD, a division of EPA that regulates uh, these kinds of insecticides. So there are a number of um, uh, mechanisms of action um, uh, that have been drugged with synthetic molecules uh, over the past um, uh, oh, 80 years or so. And, and, and the pace of discovery in crop protection is one of these major receptors is drugged with a novel uh, first-in-class molecule um, uh, per decade. So what you see here represents uh, easily 60 years of productivity of the entire uh, synthetic insecticide uh, development uh, world. Um, and furthermore, First-in-class molecules to these receptors typically realize a um, billion dollars in uh, market uh, sales. And it is our goal um, to redrug these targets with this new type of chemical matter, these small peptides, uh, and thereby uh, revitalize these targets uh, and uh, <laughs> their uh, uh, consequent sales. So here they are uh, uh, lined out, if you will, on sort of a, a, a synapse. Um, our first molecules, um, spear and what I'll refer to as 7300, uh, uh, attack the modulate or, or positive allosteric modulators uh, of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. These two um, uh, molecules uh, act by separate mechanisms, we believe. Uh, following that, 67 and 7200, uh, over here on the left, uh, act against the voltage-gated sodium channel, and uh, these uh, uh, these channels um, have been uh, 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 um, 
uh, drugged previously with uh, synthetic small molecules, pyrethrins, DDT, uh, and a variety of other chemicals. And so we're binding to them differently uh, and um, uh, we'll be bringing those mo molecules to market. The important thing here is, is I've told you two things. I've told you that uh, late stage product attrition is death for this industry. It's why we have a failing industry, uh, industry model and attrition is the product of two risk factors. It's the, uh, the, the confidence you have in the chemical matter. We have peptides, they're very low risk, and confidence in the mechanism. These are mechanisms that have been previously proven by, uh, commercial, uh, by commercializing um, them with small molecules. So we have reduced risk at the actual mechanism of action. So that means that we expect to have a very low rate of product attrition late stage in our development pipeline. So our first peptide, um, SPEAR, uh, is the first novel nerve and muscular mode of action, the types of targets that result in billion dollar markets uh, since 2007 in Rhinaxapir. And that's global research productivity. Um, it targets the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, uh, and uh, which has been previously um, uh, uh, drugged by Neonix and Spinosids, which are altogether responsible for 30% of the total uh, uh, insecticide market. Now you will recognize that Neonix are those bad products that uh, have been pilloried in the press uh, for their harmful activity to honeybees. Um, uh, and and so, uh, some substantial portion of that press uh, is real. <clears throat> but that's largely a result of the, if you will, a bioavailability of these neonics being so promiscuous that these neonics get everywhere, especially places where you don't want them like, uh, for example, in honeybees. Uh, our product binds to spear. It's much more difficult to be made bioavailable, uh, and we do not have activity against honeybees. And so, as with spear, where we have redrugged the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor without inheriting the resistance uh, that has evolved against neonix and spinosids, um, we believe that we will reestablish this market uh, with this receptor, and we will be able to do this for all these other receptors um, that are out there on the market. So our first product, it's, it, it is, uh, these peptides uh, have been called many things. They've been called inhibitory cysteine knots. They've been called knottens um, uh, and, and, and a couple other clever things by different people. Uh, what they are is a, they're approximately 40 amino acids long with three cystine bonds that cross-link this structure. Um, and um, that um, uh, uh, in, in, it gives them great stability. And uh, it, it rigidifies these structures in a way that allows them to bind uh, very tightly, very specifically uh, to invertebrate uh, ion channels. Um, this product has broad spectrum activity. It, we've had no detectable activity uh, to uh, vertebrate um, uh, species. Uh, and uh, 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 no um, practical toxicity uh, to honeybees and beneficial insects that eat um, non-beneficial insects. Um, uh, we're sustainable by virtue of the fact that we were produced by fermentation uh, uh, with uh, sugar. Uh, we have a zero-day pre-harvest interval reflective of the lack of a um, uh, MRL or uh, uh, residue level. And uh, important for workers, it has been established that these, this uh, product is so safe that we can have workers re-enter the field after four hours. This product has been uh, split into two separate products, Spear LEP for um, ingestion uh, uh, activity, uh, and, and coupled with a, a gut permeabilizer, if you will, and then a contact version uh, for uh, targeting greenhouse pests. As I mentioned, we produce these uh, with uh, a fermentation-based um, uh, 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 production system um, that it, it leads to world-class production levels. Uh, we believe these proteins. Um, and we've uh, 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 dealt with issues related to uh, the size of these molecules and the cysteine uh, not stabilization. Uh, and we believe that this production platform will apply to all the other products um, uh, that we are uh, targeting uh, commercialization of. And so this really is a um, technology platform uh, that is turnkey for a variety of new actives. Um, as I mentioned, um, we are um, these two products, uh, one for oral presentation, the other for 
contact presentation. Uh, uh, Spearlep, uh, we partner with BTK. It's a known um, biopesticide that attacks guts by uh, permeabilizing their gut. And in, in extremis, the, the insects become septic by, by the migration of viruses and um, microbes uh, passing through the gut and um, infecting the insect, but in small quantities, it permeabilizes the gut sufficient to pass our peptide into the bloodstream of these insects. Um, uh, spear T uh, for use in glass houses controls spider mites, broad mites, strips, aphids, white flies. It, it, it's the only product that exists today on the market that controls all four of the top uh, uh, pests in glass houses. So to go into the um, uh, uh, some data on um, the oral presentation. So uh, these bars are damage of fruits by oblique banded leaf roller. Uh, you see the untreated controls. It's a uh, um, uh, the number of fruits um, that are damaged uh, per some metric. Um, and then you see uh, the treatment options. We always compare against uh, the growers uh, standard, what they're using there in the field. Uh, and here you see we have Spinetaram, uh, a, a, an, an existing and quite popular product, probably one of the top three. Um, and we are uh, applying our Spear Lep, which is this oral product, uh, and we're achieving what I believe is, is comparable control, although not uh, uh, absolutely equivalent. And then we are now increasingly uh, doing programs where we rotate our uh, biopesticide with these synthetic standards or, or synthetic growers um, uh, uh, go-to products. Uh, and uh, we're seeing uh, good effects, equivalent effects. Uh, here's one with diamondback moth uh, on in cabbage looper on broccoli. And you see against uh, Radiant, again, this is Spinetaram by a different trade name in the bright blue. Um, and, um, and we're actually beating the synthetic standard in this case, where at our higher rate of application, um, we, we are uh, clearly um, uh, beating the um, uh, synthetic standard uh, in this case, uh, Spear Lep. Uh, going on to an example or two against Spear T, which is our contact activity. Uh, this is a favorite of mine, spotted wing Drosophila. Um, all of you uh, folks uh, in Michigan who are uh, uh, love our blueberries and cherries, soft skin fruit is uh, the, uh, the cl uh, a class uh, that they are known as, uh, and they are attacked by the spotted wing Drosophila, and it, uh, it lays its eggs inside un and underneath the, the the soft skin of these fruit, and uh, then you end up with these worms uh, that that grow out on the inside of these fruit. Uh, it, this is not um, a spoilage uh, that is uh, tolerated by uh, distribution and an entire load of fruit will be rejected if spotted wing drosophila damage is seen in these fruit. Um, and we're beating uh, at, at higher rates uh, spinosad, uh, which is another version of the spinet, spinetaram that I talked to you about, um, uh, which is uh, one of the best um, that they've seen. And we're beating synthetics uh, and biopesticides um, uh, as um, uh, attributed by folks at um, Michigan State uh, was uh, are the folks that did this work. Here's an example of white flies, um, uh, a, a more conventional glass house pest, uh, and flanicamid, uh, one of the grower standards, and we're performing comparably to flanicamid as well as other products. Uh, and again, we're active against thrips, uh, spider mites, white flies shown here, as well as aphids, um, the, the the top four pests. And well, we have a pipeline of these uh, molecules. Um, uh, we've, uh, we're submitting to the EPA. It says here February, but it may slip to March, um, uh, our, our second molecule. Uh, and we have others behind them uh, credibly positioned uh, to come out uh, at approximately one per year uh, in the coming years. Uh, potential billion dollar products um, uh, uh, into the uh, market. Um, uh, uh, from Vestron. So what is our lead optimization process really all about? Well, uh, it turns out that the fermentation yield manufacturing is largely baked into the molecule, how readily it folds um, before it's cleaved, um, uh, before it can be secreted. Um, and so uh, we have to design our molecules um, uh, in the primary sequence of the molecule in order to uh, get them to fold fast, uh, cross-link, and then be secreted. Um, as well, thermal stability uh, relates to, uh, one's a kinetic measure, the other's a thermodynamic measure, if you will. They need to fold fast and then stay folded. 
Uh, and so a lot of that is built into designing these small proteins. As well, we have to uh, address proteolytic stability against enzymes in the yeast. Number one, there's a lot of exoproteases that nibble off the, car uh, the C terminus and N terminus. But then uh, we throw these into insects and the insects have uh, very active proteases in their insect gut. And we have to uh, um, address cleavage sites found in these molecules such that they're not uh, proteolized. Uh, as well, of course, uh, safety, no, no vertebrate toxicity, potency. Uh, we don't wanna lose our potency against the insects uh, uh, when, when we're addressing the top three. Um, and, and, and as well, spectrum. Uh, we can have varying uh, activity against Lepidoptera versus Diptera, that is to say, caterpillars versus flies. Uh, some of this uh, is, is done guided by computational modeling, but you know, um, it, it, we do buy as many lottery tickets as we can uh, and approve our odds with the computational modeling, but I would not say all of this is entirely rational. So here's um, VST7300, which is our number three uh, molecule in development. Um, these are uh, uh, measurements of insects in days after treatment shown here, 5, 12, 19, 26. And in the bars, you see different rates of application. So you can see here that we see decreasing amounts of insects, right, as we increase the dose um, uh, of our 7300. Uh, again, here, and this is related to our, oops, this is related to our spear product in red, so we are uh, doing better than that. But in this particular case, we're struggling to reach the effectiveness of uh, 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 cyclanil, cyclanilaprol, which is one of the most recently uh, uh, released synthetic molecules on the market. Uh, we have other instances where we do better than this, uh, but this is just one field trial. Uh, yes. Um, uh, here's one uh, uh, of uh, Lepidoptera on apples. Uh, you can see a conventional program here in bright blue. Uh, these are damaged fruit, percent of damaged fruit. Uh, at the low dose of 7,300, at a higher dose, we're decreasing and actually equivalent to the conventional program. Uh, and this is just many uh, applications of this single 7,300 uh, at different rates. And then we have, um, a, a, a we insert our biopesticide into the the existing conventional rotation of synthetics. And you see we're actually doing better, uh, rotating in our 7300 and um, Spearlep, uh, uh, our, our product. And that's something that we're commonly seeing, that we're actually able to improve upon uh, synthetic treatments um, uh, by uh, rotating in our biopesticide. And here's an example of activity against aphids. Um, uh, days after treatment, uh, excuse me, uh, days after application, um, uh, and uh, you see that we are seeing declining uh, populations of aphids uh, with 7,300 in green at increasing rates, as well as uh, increasing rates of spear T, which is our name for uh, this, uh, the spear contact activity, and then imidacloprid, one of the existing synthetics, but one that has been problematic uh, because it is a neonic. Our uh, third AI, which is... Um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, should be coming on our, uh, which is uh, um, um, our third AI is one that we're working on scaling for submission of a uh, regulatory package. It's a voltage gated sodium channel. It acts, uh, what's interesting about the difference between peptides and synthetics, uh, this is a depiction of the receptor and you, you see these transmembrane alpha helices and then you see these loops that kind of stitch back and forth. And peptides generally bind to the loops, whereas synthetic molecules tend to bind within the, these helices within the membrane. And so we do typically see different binding sites because we bind to different sites we are not um, uh, sensitive to the site mutations that make that generate resistance to synthetics. So by definition, we are redrugging these products and resetting the resistance clock for these molecules. So here's um, some limited field data uh, for uh, uh, 60, uh, the 6700 program. Um, these are um, uh, amongst the bars. These are days of application. Um, uh, Oh, let me start over. This is a field of a lab assay in which we spray the field and then days after application, we harvest leaves, bring them into the laboratory and then put insects on them. And then after 24 hours, those insects are either dead or alive or after 48 hours, they're dead or alive. 
Uh, we do the same all the way up to 72 hours. And then here's one day after application, uh, we harvest leaves, bring them into the lab uh, and put insects on them and measure mortality. And you see here that as we're increasing the 6,700 dose in these applications, we are getting increasing mortality. It's always nice to see that um, uh, in these uh, uh, trials because you want to see a dose response effect. And here we see it um, uh, both immediately after application and then one day after application of the 6,700 molecule. Um, and uh, uh, 6,700 appears to be 10 times more potent uh, than actually our existing um, uh, first product that's on the market. Again, the voltage-gated uh, uh, sodium channel, uh, this is the target of our fourth uh, and, and last visible um, um, project in our portfolio. Uh, it acts in a different way. You'll note that site three binding site uh, prevents the inactivation of the voltage-gated sodium channel. Uh, site four toxins lower the, the energy barrier to opening. So if, you, uh, um, uh, if you're able to cause them to open more frequently and prevent them from closing, uh, you might expect synergy. And I can confirm, yes, we do see synergy of these two molecules, which will present sort of an interesting thing to play with in the field uh, uh, from these two products. Um, and so uh, kind of a summary of our pipeline. Uh, we have two molecules uh, coming out, uh, both working against the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. We have two more following that that work against the voltage-gated sodium channel. Uh, we believe all of them will be first-in-class molecules with, um, uh, uh, and, and hopefully we'll be able to address uh, the broader markets that uh, uh, get to those um, uh, large um, uh, uh, sales volumes. Uh, and, and what this means is that we may be able to introduce four uh, uh, molecules of this type in approximately six years, and you would compare that to the industry worldwide uh, um, now being 13 years since the last such comparable launch worldwide. Um, and uh, 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 the last two attempted launches beyond that uh, were pulled post-launch by the EPA. And not only that, one of the things that we uh, uh, got into recently was, you know, um, uh, how, how potent are these molecules? So we did a, a little test. We, we, we uh, did a fly injection assay. It tends to give very reproducible uh, results. And we looked at the activity, if you will, per molar. What is the concentration of these molecules that's required to establish 50% death of these insects? And it turns out that of the existing product, most active existing uh, products on the market, none of them are more potent than the first four molecules in our pipeline. And I think that this frames up the issue um, most pre precisely. Our molecules are not limited by their potency. They are limited by their bioavailability. And you can expect that while we do have some formulations that get generate the bioavailability uh, that uh, we need, um, but also, uh, this is an area that we are working on uh, very diligently because uh, bioavailability, formulation for bioavailability is a tremendous effort, uh, or, or a tremendous lever rather, on uh, demonstrating the potential um, uh, of these uh, future products. Um, so, uh, I, as Sandra uh, tells you, uh, uh, we are indeed uh, uh, a resident, uh, I guess now an anchor tenant uh, at the Innovation Center. Uh, we've been here for, I think, 12 years, um, and uh, we're backed by a number of life science uh, investors, um, some of which are shown here. I'll go into detail on them a little bit later. Um, uh, for that time, uh, Vestron has always had a CEO, a, 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 a director of research or a CSO, if you will, and a chief financial officer. Um, but Anna uh, uh, took on this role three years ago and has transformed the company, uh, turning us from a, a technology platform that would be acquired by an industry to now a company um, that will um, be a legitimate seller of product uh, and um, perhaps even a potential op uh, IPO opportunity as what happened uh, with the um, uh, as what happened uh, in the pharma space. Um, in the time that she's been here, she has built out the commercial side of this organization, uh, building a sales team, um, a regulatory department, 
Um, you, we are um, uh, pursuing registration of these molecules worldwide, uh, and that is an incredibly uh, complex task. Uh, we have um, a whole manufacturing team uh, uh, generating product and distri distributing it uh, uh, to uh, where our sales team is. And uh, Andy has uh, joined somewhere in the middle of all that uh, in uh, business uh, development. Uh, so a lot of changes going on at, at uh, Vestron. Uh, some of our, um, uh, uh, the newest investor uh, to join us uh, is, uh, as announced today, uh, um, North Pond, um, uh, a legitimate, I would say, uh, uh, large uh, pharma investor. So this is our uh, one of our first pharma um, uh, backers uh, that, who are looking to cross out of the uh, what is perceived to be an overvalued uh, pharma space into uh, opportunities outside of that in the more sustainable um, and in this in this case ag Novo Holdings, which is uh, the holding company of Novo Zymes um, uh, and Novo Nordisk, um, is uh, has has been with us uh, for two years now, uh, and then of course we have now. Um, <clears throat> Syngenta Ventures, which is a um, uh, a strategic investor, uh, if you will, as Syngenta is a legitimate ag, ag chem company. So where are we going uh, next? Um, so we're focusing on cysteine-rich peptides uh, for insect control. Uh, we expect to redrug all the major synthetic insecticide targets um, and, and, and uh, leave the industry with safer, more environmentally friendly molecules without sacrificing any of the um, efficacy uh, of existing uh, products uh, on the market. Uh, we expect to cross over into other areas as well, particularly fungicidal and micro uh, antimicrobial um, uh, products um, and uh, in the ag space. Uh, and it's uh, not clear where that takes us, as well as uh, uh, potentially antiparasitics uh, in animal health. And um, uh, uh, if uh, our um, manufacturing platform, if our proprietary yeast uh, do um, uh, have advantages, uh, that might find application elsewhere. So I think that's uh, what I uh, had planned uh, to show you today. Um, uh, let me see. Are we still all there? I'm happy to address any questions uh, people might have uh, on uh, this program. Uh, changing and exciting times for Vestron, indeed. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bob. Uh, it's Jack Aaron. Jack Aaron. I have a question. Have a question. Sure. Uh, uh, I know the company's know the evolved company's over the evolved. years, but yes. in uh, 50 yes. minutes of talking, yes. I never yes. heard you mention spider venom. <laughs> you have know you gotten away from that totally? Uh, we have, absolutely. Um, okay. I, 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 you know, um, it, it, at an earlier stage in the company, when we did not have um, um, uh, consumer exposure, um, it, it was uh, uh, saying those words, <laughs> um, uh, it, it generates amusement, interest, uh, and excitement uh, among uh, the then audience. Um, but uh, now we think that uh, thinking beyond that uh, uh, allows us to talk about larger addressable markets, as well as staying away from any potential mm, uh, 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 sort of activist um, exposure. <laughs> okay, great. The other question I had, what does this run on a cost per acre? I mean, how does that compare? You showed efficacy with a lot of the other things, but yeah. what about cost per acre? And how many times do you have to put it down? Yeah, so uh, completely consistent with existing agronomic practice and prices. So um, for the, the product that is generating all the revenue, we are generating revenue. We are now uh, experiencing a positive margin. Um, I think we're charging about 30 to $35 an acre. I'm not really the one to, to, to uh, uh, run down all those numbers, um, but 30 to $35 per acre is what a synthetic chemical, um, uh, one of the leading synthetic chemicals against which there isn't a lot of resistance yet. Uh, is able to attract. We are certainly that. Uh, we have the efficacy. We can demonstrate it in rotation trials with other synthetics. Uh, 
Um, and so we are peers to those molecules. Um, in, in this space, you'll see biopesticides comparing themselves to biopesticides. I think we're the only biopesticide provider comparing ourselves to synthetics with data. And how many times do you have to apply it during the season? Uh, typically, when you're uh, uh, addressing a given pest, um, you, you have a weekly spray. Uh, we have seen uh, effective efficacy 20 days out beyond the first spray. That, uh, so we are looking to be able to, um, so BT is only stable in the field for uh, three days or so, um, and, and that's our per gut permeabilizer. But with that product, we're able to go out to 20 days. We've seen um, uh, data for. And so we might be able to skip applications. That's another angle on um, advertising the effective, uh, the, the desirable attributes of these products. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Bob, this is uh, Jeff. Uh, great job and congratulations on the oversubscribed round. Are you know, you know, coming out of the fundraising round, you know, and, and especially being oversubscribed, are you seeing a lot of that crossover with the pharma, you know, into ag, or you know, is this just still sort of the the you know the you know not not the you know you know the firm you had North North Pond is not the the exception to the rule, or do you think you see this more happening now? Well, you know, I, I, I think pharma was very active um, uh, here recently. Um, I have heard, uh, I, I'm not really involved in a lot of those discussions, but I have heard that valuations have gotten um, pretty rich uh, in that space. And so, you know, right now, the, all the rage is ESG. Uh, we are uh, ESG. Uh, well, we're certainly E and S. It remains to be seen how G we are. Right. Um, so uh, in uh, uh, environmental, sustainable uh, and governance. Um, and uh, um, so uh, I, I, we have two now um, in Novo and North Pond. Um, and uh, uh, um, uh, how many more rounds we go depends really on how quickly our positive margin sustains the company or how heavily we step on the gas uh, to take more money to go faster. Uh, we have the potential to be a first muse, a mover in this space, and uh, we are working very hard to extend our, our uh, patent fences out uh, and claim low-hanging fruit um, and become the dominant player in this space, much as happened in uh, the pharma space for the early players. Yeah, that, that sort of, you know, my next question basically leads into it is that, you know, with this round, I mean, do you have sort of goals that you want to accomplish with this? Or, I mean, is it still sort of, you know, now that you have the capital, you can sort of talk with your board and figure out how, you know, how quickly you want to move or where you want to go or. Yeah, we, we came to the board uh, pre-raise uh, with a strategic long range strategic plan. Um, and uh, I think uh, as as an outcome of that uh, uh, of this round and the int and the interest expressed, uh, we are being um, we are going back to that strategic plan and asking the questions I described earlier: step on the gas or go to um, uh, cash flow neutral. Perfect. Thanks for your help. Yeah. Wonderful. Are there any other questions for Bob from our audience? If so, feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. And if we'll wait and see if anyone else is going to ask, I'm going to bring one up. Um, so, you know, part of this is about um, bringing in people who are not only, you know, in the entrepreneurial space, Space, but also have faculty appointment over at WMed. I was just wondering, what has been your experience so far? Have you been able, um, has there been opportunity for you to engage at WMed? And if so, kind of what's that experience been like for you? So um, I have not found the, 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 the place where I to plug into WMed. At one point, uh, Vestron had a program developing a synthetic insecticide that was sponsored by the, the um, effectively by Gates Foundation, right? Uh, and that was for the control of um, vectors of malaria. Um, and uh, uh, um, ultimately, we decided that development of synthetic chemicals did not align well with um, sort of the, the the vision we were creating for the company. Um, uh, that program was, however, really useful uh, to the company as it evolved. Um, 
uh, as as we evolved during, I think, uh, difficult times so going back to 2009, 10, etc. Um, uh, uh, so I, I, I think there are public health connections uh, that we can make, and I, I'd like to think more about. Uh, as well, I think our programs could take on a pharma dimension if uh, we get into the antiparasitic uh, and antibacterial space. Uh, we won't go in with the intention to develop um, pharmaceuticals in that space, um, but that may be an outcome. Uh, uh, I, I, I would have to say I'm, I'm having difficulty finding bandwidth. <laughs> so, so uh, 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 and, and I'm not sure that there's any other answer I can give to my CEO, right? Um, so that's yeah. uh, th that's what I'd say. I, I do, however, and am in the middle of um, co-teaching a uh, a class um, of um, uh, pharmacy students at U of M on drug discovery. So I'm still keeping a, a, a hand in those waters a little bit. Uh, one finds the large and lose all those library privileges. Having a connection to a university is absolutely essential. Um, and it's a, a real strong motivator for having these adjunct positions that um, uh, we're, we're talking about. So, so maybe we can treat, teach drug discovery over at the medical school. I, I don't know. Haven't, I haven't thought about it. No, that's okay. It's wonderful. We love having you as part of our part of our program. We'll find ways. We'll just give us time, right? We'll keep looking yeah. for ways uh, to engage really smart and talented people such as yourself uh, into some of the work that we're doing. So thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience at this point before we wrap it up? No. Well, before I let you all go, I would like to simply point out uh, that we do have another, another Medical Entrepreneur Speaker Series coming up in May. So on May 19th, we will welcome Dr. Rolf Kleitzen. He is WMED Research Professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences. He's also the former co-founder and Senior Vice President for Research and board member for the Metabolic Solutions Development Company, which has spun out some really interesting technology that is in clinical trials right now. And he'll be able to talk about some of the work that um, has gone on there. I would like to thank you very much, Bob Kennedy, for joining us today in the evening, taking time off after your busy day to share with us the wonderful story of Vestron. And congratulations again on that wonderful fundraising round. More money means go faster, bring that product to market faster, get it in, into everyone's hands faster, um, and really impact the uh, the food chain, the food system of the globe. I think it's fabulous, and uh, you guys just keep on doing what you're doing because you're doing great. Um, yeah, I've with never that, had in my life. Yeah. Good Thank presentation, you, Bob. Thank you. And everyone, Thanks we will see well. you again in May. Thank you all. Have a beautiful evening. Be safe, be healthy, be well, and we will see you again. Thanks, Bye -bye. Andrew. Bye. Yep. Bye-bye.